the physics video lecture once again. Key Psi 168 video lecture 20. We are talking about the theory of thermal physics and got a pretty theoretical discussion today, but I brought our props and we're going to take it systematically again. So in fact, we'll review what we learned. We have thermal physics and very briefly, we're starting with hot and cold. Hot and cold sensations. Okay. What you feel on your skin. So we then associated the hot with fire and the cold with the ice, which seems legitimate. Then we talked about some phenomena that go along with that. You know, other phenomena, and in particular, phenomena of thermal expansion. So there are different types of thermal expansion. Uh, and remember I had the balls and the rings that expanded and either passed or didn't pass through each other. And I also had the bimetallic strip when I had put some heat on this thing, it bends. It was pretty interesting as well. So that was thermal expansion. And we saw immediately that we could make a thermometer. For example, this level of bending was as hot as a flame and straight up and down with room temperature. Later on in the semester, I'll show you that if I dip it in liquid air, liquid nitrogen, it'll actually bend in the other direction, uh, meaning it's very, very cold temperatures. Okay, for now you have to take my word for it. It's a, it's a room temperature and above thermometer. So we have thermometers. And once we have a rudimentary thermometer, if you want to get more accurate, we have to you know, be careful with it and invent a temperature scale. So from the thermometers, we get temperature scales. And we decided that we would use degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. Now degrees Fahrenheit is still what they'll tell us in terms of what we hear in the news for the weather report, for instance. Degrees Celsius will be the unit of temperature uh, that goes along with our other physical units. Kilograms, meters, seconds, degrees Celsius. The formulas are built to be most convenient that way. Okay, so that's fine. So we had those temperature scales. And then I was talking about this type of thermometer, which has a little column of fluid inside. I said mercury, it could very well be an alcohol thermometer. but. Uh, you warm it up at the bottom. So right now it's room temperature, it's just over 20 degrees Celsius. And if I just hold this, I can, but you can't. I can see the column move up, actually in real time, okay? If I were to apply the flame to it, it's not doing anything stupid, right? But what can go wrong? It shoots up, okay? No damage done. Good, so that's the thermometer, and I'll go ahead and draw that one because it's important. In fact, I will draw it in a beaker, and we've got a thermometer here, much thinner than that, but I can fit some red ink inside. There we go. goes up a certain uh, certain distance here and then I indicate a scale. So that's always my cartoon of a thermometer. Okay, there are many different kinds of thermometers at this point. Infrared one that they point at your forehead. Okay. We can maybe explain that later. But for now, our thermometers are using thermal expansion. Later they'll use any physical phenomenon that correlates with temperature. Okay, so far so good. 
And that's about as far as we had gotten, but I had introduced the gas thermometer. And this is what we're gonna spend the rest of the hour longer or shorter uh, discussing. So the gas thermometer, I'll do one more demonstration of it, and then we'll do a, should we draw that thing? We'll draw it, but we're gonna do a more uh, interesting drawing later. I'll save the drawing for later, but I will demonstrate this once again. Um, so there's a thermometer that tells me how hot, say whatever is in this beaker is. So for example, if I had water in the beaker and then I could raise the temperature gradually and the thermometer would tell me, okay, room temperature, now it's you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 90, 100 degrees Celsius, okay. So that's what this thing represents. Now this part here though, which I take out, this is just a flask with air inside. There's a tube, the rubber tube connects to this reservoir with the red fluid inside. And that tube goes up to here and is just then open to the atmospheric pressure at the top. And in fact, I could open this, okay, close it again, and now I know it's atmospheric pressure everywhere. So the pressure is the same inside here as we have up here, okay, so fine. So now I'm gonna, since I'm in a hurry, I'm gonna hit this with a little bit of flame. And I'm heating up the glass and the air inside the glass. See how far this went. Not bad, okay, it came up quite a ways. And you'll see it cools down again. I'm gonna do this and see if I can observe it from the side here, okay. There we go, okay. I don't want to damage anything, but. Good. So we definitely saw the fluid move up in the tube here. So I think that's it for the practical demonstration. Now we have to get theoretical with this. Um, we saw what we saw, increase the temperature here, push this up there. There is atmospheric pressure, there was. There we go, we'll go back to this. So we atmospheric pressure everywhere when we heated the, flat, the air in the flask, it increased the pressure in the flask because that's what pushed down on the red fluid. Higher pressure pushed down on it, therefore it went up on the other side. Okay, pushed down on it, went up on the other side. So this, that can be a gas thermometer apparently. We have to be a little more careful with ours. So we have the gas thermometer, that was a demo, and what we're going to do next is the constant volume gas thermometer. So this is a detail, but I'm going to insist on it and I'll show you how it's realized. The point is, is that the volume in this uh, vessel here did not stay the same, the volume of the fluid. And there's a way, because it got pressed down and went up on there, so there's a way to keep that volume constant. Um, and I'll show you how that goes. So I'm going to go ahead and erase everything here. And this is what we're doing, the constant volume gas thermometer. This whole discussion, with any luck, it'll fit on one board. Make sure we're not blocking any of the board. Should fit right here. So constant volume gas thermometer. Here's the picture that we have. We have the beaker. Say it has water in it. 
and then we have our flask, easy to, easier to draw than to the sphere. Okay. And there's gas in here, and there's water in the beaker. And we're gonna bring this over. <clears throat> Do another flask here. This has a fluid in it. In honor of that thing, we're gonna make that fluid red. We're gonna come out the bottom of this with a flexible, this indicates a flexible, uh, give it one more way, a flexible tube. Okay. And that flexible tube is connected to a long column. So you can see what each part represents. It's all represented here in the same way, except that we have this flexible tube so we can raise and lower it because this volume here is going to remain constant. In other words, the, the fluid line, okay, did we say we're using red fluid? We're using red fluid, okay. The fluid line has to remain constant. And you can do that by adjusting this thing here. And at some point, the red fluid went up to here. Okay. So we will draw that right there. You know, I'll title this right here so that it's the volume gas thermometer. So you'll see why all the details here are necessary. Okay. And uh, since there is a gas in here, I'll go ahead and make the blue dots for the gas. And they're connected here. Why am I doing the dots? Well, we already know, or we're assuming that the gas is molecular, okay? That's gonna be key to the whole discussion that gases are made of atoms, okay? Atoms and molecules. Good, so here's our beaker. We've got, let's say we have water in here. And, you know, we can heat the water with a flame. Heat with a flame, systematically heat it. But we have in here a thermometer, degrees Celsius. So we always know what the temperature is of this water. And as we increase the temperature, just as I did before, you know, we increase the pressure here, this goes over, this pushes down on the red column, brings it up, but we adjust this thing vertically to make sure the volume in here remains the same, okay. the volume of the gas. Okay. Flexible to adjust. Okay, constant volume. Now, we're going to make a series of measurements, and as the temperature increases, the pressure increases, the height of this column measures the pressure. So let's go ahead and note that as well. Height of the column measures the pressure. And the pressure where? The pressure in the gas. And of course the pressure in the gas is what's pressing down on this thing here. So, so far so good. Okay, so we have that constant volume gas thermometer. Um, good, and now, so next, we're gonna graph, 
graph the measured pressure as a function of the temperature. Graph the pressure as a function of temperature. goes and by the way when you when we do this graph now we have to leave a lot of a lot of space to the left so I draw a graph out to the left here up to the right here and this is temperature in degrees Celsius this is pressure don't care what the units are atmospheres for example and we're basically measuring between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius and that's really convenient because you can have melting ice and you can have boiling water and everything in between. Okay, so that's really convenient. And we get a set of data points and you can imagine the pressure increases with the temperature. So the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. And this is one gas. I'm just going to imagine this is uh, helium. And we do a different, oops, we do a different set of, uh, a different gas. And this is gas B, maybe that would be nitrogen. We can do a few different gases. And what is found is that these things extrapolate. So we can extrapolate this. We would take a ruler through our data points and we would extrapolate blue dots. And if we did a third gas and extrapolate it, they always end up at the same point here. Okay. So that's some mystery temperature. Um, so let's put that in words, extrapolation. Extrapolation of uh, these pressure versus temperature. Okay. We'll graph the pressure versus the temperature. Extrapolation of these data uh, um, points uh, leads to the same point. Semicolon. Same temperature. That's pretty interesting, and that temperature happens to be minus 273 degrees Celsius. You can't make a gas that cold and have it stay gas. You'll actually liquefy air, you'll liquefy nitrogen if you get it that cold. But they all point there. And so this is a very important temperature, and it is referred to as absolute zero. This temperature shows up in other connections as well. It's called absolute zero. This is the coldest temperature that can even exist anywhere. It is the coldest of the cold. So this is absolute zero. Okay. And the explanation for that is is that this is the temperature at which all molecular motion ceases. Everything is rigidly stopped and it can't get any colder than that because the motion and the heat are correlated with each other. In fact, not, I'm sorry, not the heat, the temperature is a measure of the motion of the molecules. So I'm gonna explain that a little more, but for now we have this absolute zero What's also found is if you declare this as your temperature scale, then pressure and temperature are just linearly related, okay? Straight line graph pressure as a function of temperature. So that's the significance, a lot of significance of this. I wanted to have it all on one board, that's not gonna happen, okay? But I can say a couple of things here. So, so, if we choose minus 273 degrees Celsius to equal zero, and we're gonna call it capital K, zero Kelvin, 
this may be in the way. I'm make sure it's not. If we choose that to be zero Kelvin, then pressure, and I'll just use capital P, is proportional to temperature. That's not the case if we use Celsius, but if we use Kelvin and start down here, at absolute zero pressure is proportional to temperature, and you get something called the ideal gas law. Um, so I'm gonna squeeze that in there as well. I'll probably have to do some erasing at this point. Ideal gas law. But actually all of the results I wanted to um, showcase are up now. And now we'll just go on with the interpretation of this. Okay. So we do these experiments, we do a whole series of them. You know, we get different heights there, different heights of the column of fluid here, and that measures the pressure in the gas. And then we graph it, and as the temperature went up, these pressures are basically the height of the column going up. But the interesting thing is that it's, you know, it's, if you're extrapolating, it's aiming at this temperature. If you do another gas, it's aiming at that. If you do a third one, it's aiming there. And so we think there's some universal behavior there, right? Some universal property. Okay, so now let's just draw the conclusions. Okay, yeah, so I have to erase something, so I'm going to erase this. So what follows is formulated there, now I've got more room. If P equals zero K, and that means Kelvin, for some formal reason they don't put a little, okay, it's not okay, it's zero K. Okay. Um, they don't put a little circle up there when you're talking Kelvin, if you're really picky equals minus 273 degrees Celsius. And by the way, the Kelvin scale has the, has the same interval as the Celsius scale. Okay. As Celsius. So if we choose this absolute zero, then pressure is proportional to temperature. So then you get the ideal gas law. And just for your notes, because you may have seen this in a chemistry class, PV equals N. Actually, if you saw it in a chemistry class, you had NRT. Or if you saw it in physics class, PV equals capital N Boltzmann constant times P. So that's just for culture. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna calculate anything with that. But the ideal gas law has this form. And you can see the constant volume aspect, because if the volume's constant, you just get the proportionality. Okay. You can, you know, pressure proportional to temperature, pressure proportional times temperature, if the volume's constant. Okay. So that's where that came from. Okay, so that's the first consequence, and we're going to, we will be using the Kelvin scale in the course of the semester, so it's, yeah, it's just the Celsius scale shifted. Make that an absolute thing. Good, so that's our first consequence. So the next one assumes what we call atomism. So we're going to assume the molecular nature um, of matter. So, so 
So this absolute zero temperature, if you have the idea of atoms, and it's important that we know that matter is composed of atoms and molecules. So atomism, right? That's the theory, philosophy that matter is composed of atoms. So atomism, in this aspect here, all motion stops at T equals zero Kelvin. That's because of the idea of atomism. And immediately after that, we realize that temperature is a measure of atomic motion. So the hotter, I don't have my picture up there anymore, the hotter the air in this flask. Okay. Go ahead and have the flask out there. So the air is hotter in here, the molecules are moving faster, that translates all the way over to here. Molecules are moving faster. They collide with the fluid. They push it down. Faster motion, faster collisions, more pressure. Okay. So temperature is a measure of molecular motion. And not just molecular motion, but molecular speed. Okay. Temperature is a measure of molecular speed. Now there's a formula I could have you guys look up, but first of all, a hot gas or a hotter gas has faster molecules. How about that? Faster molecules. This is actually a whole very quantitative uh, thing, but we're not going to use the formulas. You can look them up if you want. So homework, this is kind of a homework or just something for you to do if you're interested. Um, find the formula for V root mean square proportional to the square root of the temperature divided by the mass of the molecules. Go ahead and look up that formula. That'll be interesting. It's the root mean square speed. It's proportional to the square of the temperature in Kelvin. And uh, we're not going to do it, but if you plug the numbers in for molecular masses, the natural constants that go with it, you find B on the order of, here at room temperature, a thousand meters per second. The atoms are bouncing around at a thousand meters per second. Okay, so temperature is a measure of molecular speed, very important. And so we have to add a note to that. Oh, using this lower board on me. Mass of the molecule. Okay. Mass of the molecule, that's what that little M is. Well, you've got some little mass and you've got some speed and it's a thousand meters per second. These are tiny, tiny masses. But what do you have? You have kinetic energy. Okay. So I'm going to keep numbering my list here. We have molecules, because of their speed, have kinetic energy. Let's write it out. Kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, of course, is one half mv squared. So there are enormous numbers of gas molecules moving around at high speed in here. You wouldn't guess it. They have kinetic energy. And the higher the speed, the higher the temperature, the higher the speed, the more kinetic energy. Okay. But now we're at the, at the concept of energy where before we were just having hot and cold. Okay. So we've actually made it where we want to arrive at. So the molecules have kinetic energy, very clearly, but energy is the capacity to do work. 
right? So energy turns into work. And I hadn't brought it up yet, but we saw precisely that. Namely, the fluid moving up here, okay, the fluid moving up in the tube, meant that a mass was being raised up. Okay, if a mass is being raised up, then work is being done. So actually, this, this doesn't qualify formally as a heat engine, but I had heat here. All I knew was burn my hand, heat the gas, and I actually aimed it there, and I had work done. Okay, so we've made the contact. We made contact with the concept of work. So I'm just going to round that out. Um, so for the example, the column of fluid in the gas thermometer. And now that we're thinking about it, the column of fluid that, of course you guys can't see on this camera, but the column of fluid in this thermometer, if it moves up, there's work being done. So a column of fluid in the gas thermometer thermometer was raised. Okay. It was raised at elevation and we know work is MGH. Okay. So that's the theoretical development, a practical development too, that I wanted to show you today. We've made contact between just pure sensation of hot and cold via our different phenomena, but with the gas thermometer, we made it very clear um, that column of water was raised, so there's work. Actually, strictly speaking, we didn't need the uh, we didn't need atomism for that. We could have just looked at this thing and said, "Wow!" Just empirically, we could have said, "Wow!" The heat that we applied here raised the column there, so work was done. But we do need the atomism to recognize that there's that kinetic energy there, right? And we get the transformation of kinetic energy to work, potentially kinetic and so forth. We need that um, in order to have a proper theory. And we have it too, okay? We're gonna accept atomism here, even though I can't actually prove them in this lecture. Maybe I could if I put my mind to it. But uh, yeah, that would actually be an interesting topic to look into. Um, so I don't actually have any formal homework. I want you to possibly look these formulas up and add them to your notes. So I'll just call this homework. It's just stuff that you're adding to your notes. Anyway, that's what all the homework is, right? So what are proofs of atomism or arguments in favor of atomism? That, that's actually an interesting thing for you guys to look up. Atomism was already proposed in, during classical antiquity, 2,000 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago. Um, and it was a contentious subject. Even some people, the chemists came around pretty early, but uh, it was not necessarily accepted even in the early, earliest 20th century, believe it or not. So anyway, that would be, an, that would be something for you guys to look into. Um, and add to your notes. But uh, the development we have today, that takes us to the next question. Okay, and I'll, I'll put that in here since I got this much board. Example. Next. How much energy? Okay, we, now we have work, we have energy, but how much? Okay. Up until now, we know joules, we know lifting stuff up. So we're going to make that connection. Uh, that'll be the next topic. Good. See you guys next time.